You're listening to Navigating the French on Paris Underground Radio. For more great content and a bonus episode of Navigating the French, please join us on Patreon. Hello, and welcome to Navigating the French, the podcast where each episode, we take a look at a French word and try and see what it tells us about French culture. I'm your host, Emily Monaco. Today, I'm chatting with author Harriet Welty Rochefort. She's here to talk to us about why the French always seem like they look like they're in a bad mood, and yet we borrowed their term for joy into English. Joie de vivre. Welcome, Harriet. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Harriet, can you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do here in France? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to your podcast. It's a delight to be here. I'm an American in Paris, uh, but I'm a little bit unusual in the sense that I've been an American in Paris for 50 years, married to a Frenchman. And I worked as a, a freelance journalist for many, many years, writing for Time and what was then the Herald Tribune, which is now the New York Times International, and many different publications. And then I decided to write books. So I've written uh, four books. Three are about the French and the way they act. And the last one, Final Transgression, is a novel. And uh, it's about uh, a woman trapped in a bad situation in World War II. So uh, you've got the first French toast, French fried, joie de vivre, and final transgression. I hope that your uh, listeners will be interested in looking them up just using my name on Amazon. Absolutely. And I'll also drop some links in our show notes so that people have easy access to those books. I'm sure that our Francophile listeners will love reading all about all of these books, but you are here today specifically because of your third book entitled Joie de Vivre which I think is a super interesting phrase to delve into. And my first question, I think, you know, you've been here for even longer than I have. I think we both know that it's unfair to think of the French as being unjoyful or pessimistic, but that is kind of the image that we have about them, which means that there's something so interesting about us borrowing this phrase, joie de vivre, into English from French, when the French seem so unjoyful to us Americans. So can you sort of Break that down for us a little bit. Does French joy look different than American joy? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, let me just backtrack here. I, one day I was sitting in the metro and I was having exactly the same kind of thoughts that you were just describing. I just looked at the people around me and I said, "These, they look so glum. They look so unhappy. How, how could they have invented the phrase joie de vivre? It's just not possible. And that's what got the whole book started, actually. So, yeah, uh, I, you know, it's, it's a very different kind of thing. Joie de vivre is more of a, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be exuberant. And going back to the metro, I mean, nobody's happy on the metro. But the, the French don't have the generalized smile. You know, they, they're not afraid of going into their own thoughts and kind of being alone with them. So what you're seeing on the metro are sleepy people going to their jobs and you shouldn't judge the whole nation by that. Oh, you, you can't, fortunately, because the French have plenty of joie de vivre. I mean, not all the French, but most of the French have a lot of joie de vivre that we'll talk about later on in this, in this program. But what is that joie de vivre? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that's, that is what's so interesting to explore is sort of what joy can look like. Yes, exactly. I think uh, French j joy... Uh, is less exuberant and less planned and less expected. I think we Americans have this expectation of happiness. We've got to have it and we've got to share it. We've got to show everybody that we're happy. The French are much more at ease with being unhappy, but they're also uh, at ease with uh, the quiet joys of, of life as well as the exuberance. So it's it's a more complicated affair, I would say. Yeah, and that's something that you explore a lot in your book in the various chapters of sort of these these small pleasures and also the the ways in which the French prioritize joy without planning for it. So I think that's yeah. a really interesting discrepancy where in the US I feel like we um you know we have l literally written into our guidelines of being an American we have this right to pur pursue happiness. Yes. But the French really don't seem to pursue it. They 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 have it, but they don't like 
hunt it down. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, in the States, it's a chase. And of course, it is inscribed in the Bill of Rights, for heaven's sakes, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the right to life, liberty and, and happiness. But uh, the French don't see it at all that way. And they're not running around pursuing uh, this kind of elusive uh, happiness. The, the way we are, I think I think in America, we segment our lives. Oh, now I'm going to work. Oh, now I'm going to have pleasure kind of thing. Whereas the, the French mix it all up and they try to find joy in very simple things. It's, I'll just think, of, I'll just share a little anecdote I was thinking about. The son of a good a friend of mine who is Franco-American, the, the good friend of mine is American, married to a Frenchman, so her son is Franco-American. And he went to work in the States when he's about 20 in San Francisco. And then when he came back, he said, you know, there's something really kind of strange or different to me in the States. He said, after work, everybody just split. And he said, after work in France, we all get together, we go to a cafe and we laugh and we talk and share things. And then, then we go home. But in, the, in, the, in America, everybody was very serious. They were at work and then they went home. Yeah. And so his joie de vivre as a French person would, would be, well, okay, we worked and that was fine. And now we're having fun kind of thing. Yeah. And I have noticed that as well as, I mean, you were talking about the segmenting of, you know, the American day, but I do feel like the French also segment their day, but in a different way. Like they, they work for the time that they're working and they do work quite hard, but then when they're done, whether it's at that midday pause or at the, or, you know, the coffee break or the cigarette break or after work, work is over and now they're ready for something else. Yes. Yeah. Where I, I think in the States, well, of course, we're talking about, you know, great generalities, all French and all Americans. Of course. I can't say you know, that about everybody. But but I do find that there's a difference in the way people mix it up. And that in the state, we're a very work-oriented society in the States. And there are many good reasons for that. And we'll get into that later because people have to pay for their health care. And they have to pay for a college education. And they have to really be on it. Whereas in, the French don't have those constraints. I mean, they have minimum worry about those two major uh, issues. Well, yeah. And let's, let's talk about that because I think that that was a really interesting point that you raised in your book. And I obviously, you know, I've been living here for in, in France for 15 years. I have, you know, access to all of the wonderful pieces of, of the system in France. Um, And I hadn't really thought about, but of course it's so true that when you don't have that stress hanging over your head of all of these expensive things that you're going to have to work towards and and pay for, maybe you have a little more time um, and a little more space. So can you tell me a little bit about sort of where you perceive that link between the French healthcare system and their joy and maybe a lack of risk leading to a more joyful existence? Is that sort of where that is? Sure. Yeah. when, When you don't have that hanging over your head, when you don't have hanging over your head the knowledge that if you get deathly ill or somebody gets in a horrible accident and the rest of your life you're going to have to be uh, paying, uh, or if, if you're lucky to have health insurance, that you will be paying for it and calculating your bills and doing this and that. When you don't have that, imagine the huge weight that, that uh, goes off of you. And that's that. I think it's fundamental. I really do. I'll give you an example. In France, as you know, because you, you've lived here for 15 years, you've got this uh, social security card, the carte vitale, which you show to your doctor when you go. And uh, the thing about France is the sicker you are, the more you're covered for your health care. So if you have a chronic illness, you know, something that's not going to go away, uh, your health care coverage is 100%. So you, you go to the doctor with your heart attack or your whatever you've got, the hospital, uh, you show the card, you don't even know what you've paid because it's taken care of by the by the system. And I mean, it's that's unimaginable in the States where everything is, you know, insurance companies and, you know, what, what are you covered for? What aren't you covered for? What might you be covered for kind of thing? In France, it's just a simple deal. It's a one payer system. And that's the end of it. Now, some people call that socialism. If that's socialism, I like socialism. <laughs> I, you know, I was just in the hospital like in January with a major problem. And um, other than the major problem itself, I didn't have any worries about, oh, God, how much is this going to cost me? You know, and, and that's just a, a tremendous relief in your life. 
Absolutely. And, and obviously, you know, one of the downsides of this system, of course, is that, you know, it is, it is all taken care of, but it is heavily bureaucratic and there's often a lot of arguing. But I do get the sense, both from my experience and from your book, that the French actually kind of relish, the, the arguing does not, does not negate the joy. There's a little bit of joy oh, in arguing. God. I'm glad you're bringing this up. Listen, <laughs> the title of my book is Joie de Vivre, and the subtitle is Secrets of Wining, Dining, and Romancing Like the French, Okay. Well, I wanted the subtitle to be Secrets of Whining, Dining, Romancing, and Squabbling Like the French. Mm -hmm. And my New York editor wasn't having it. She said, you can't put that on the cover. That's really negative. And I said, but you don't get it. The point is that the French enjoy discussing things and getting into arguments and stuff. It's, it's, it's part of their joie de vivre. But uh, see, that was, that's what I said. Oh, we're up against a real cultural gap here. And I think that's something that's that's an element of the French consciousness that longtime listeners of the podcast will recognize from our um, episode on débat. But I did want to delve into this a little bit further because I think there's a double element of this because on the one hand, you know, this squabbling, this debating, arguing can almost be it's almost like an activity. It's fun. They relish it. It's sort of a way that the French can show off that they're that they're smart, that they're that their tongue is sharp as a sword. That's right. But also, I think there's this piece of this where we as Americans, we like being liked. And I don't think the French either care about being liked or maybe they even kind of like being disliked because yeah. it makes them interesting. That's How do you sort good. of see that? I'm just fascinated by this, you know. I mean, I, I think it's a public-private thing. I'll talk about that kind mm -hmm. of gap. It's a public kind of thing. In, in private, they probably, you know, do want their friends to like them. But uh, in public, they don't care. And and you're right. Uh, it, they don't mind. In fact, they might even like not being liked. It doesn't make any difference. It's, life is not a popularity contest. And uh, it shows, as you say, it might show that they're interested, that they have something to say, that they're not just some old, boring person, you know. So it it means a whole totally different thing in France than it does in America. Absolutely. Yeah. Because America, uh, uh, getting to the point most people are, uh, in France are at just naturally, would you'd almost be uh, getting out your gun in America. Yeah. I mean... I think the French, the French love, um, the French love to say the word no, the French love to make you work for it. That's right. What's interesting about that too, I mean, as an American, when you come into that system, it can feel really frustrating and right. you can, you can be thinking to yourself, oh my God, everybody here is so mean. But in reality, if a French person does that to another French person, they almost get joy out of rising to the challenge. Exactly. And, uh, in my book, as a matter of fact, I, I, I quoted something, if you, if you would just let me read this very brief Please. Quote. I put, some Americans mistakenly think that the French are anti-American because they are aggressive. Think again. The love of being contrary, irritable, easily aroused, and quick to fight goes way back in time and has nothing to do with others' nationality. And this is what I thought was really interesting. Amanius Barcinellius AD 330-400 wrote, the Gauls are generally tall with white skin, blonde hair, and frightful and ferocious eyes. Their mood is quarrelsome and extremely arrogant. Any of them in a fight will resist several brawlers at a time with no other help than his wife's and even more dangerous fighter. Whether calm or wrathful, the Gauls always sound threatening or irritable. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You know, I said, you know, wow, this is just, you know, it's we'll talk about character traits. <laughs> Seriously, that is wild that that can that started all the way back then and sort of pervades the French mindset and approach even today. It's kind of crazy. It is. It is. I was just I was just fascinated by that. I know, I'm blown away. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I do too. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Don't Miss This, which will clue you into some of the most interesting events happening in Paris right now. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Navigating the French. Now, there's something else that you highlight quite a bit um, in your book that is a subject that's near and dear to my heart, which is the French approach to food. So the French reap so much joy from their food, but I really appreciated your sort of highlighting 
the French women's approach to dieting and eating healthfully because I feel like it's really, really different. The French, the French women seem to love being thin and beautiful, but they also really love their food. And that is something that fascinates Americans. People have written books all about that. But I'd love to hear sort of where you see that line of joy in your in aesthetics and in your appearance, but also the joy of eating kind of where does that converge? Well, I'd st- start start with eating. I, and I like to talk in terms of anecdotes. I love an anecdote. <laughs> yeah, I was fascinated by this too. So I start by watching my, my sister-in-law, who is uh, French and who is slim and who is a fabulous cook and who does nothing but invite people to dinner. I mean, sumptuous dinners, wonderful dinners. And, um, you know, so you could say, my goodness, she should be, you know, really overweight. But she eats at those dinners. But, you know, the French like to eat well, but they like to eat well with other people. And conviviality is very important. It's a very important ingredient in that dinner. And and French people like, just normal French people like my sister-in-law, they give the dinner party and to have good food, but they also want good conversation. And they're, they're not doing the meal to show off and show what a big chef they are and how they've mastered this recipe or that. They're giving the party because of the joy of having other people to their table, the joy of having a pretty table, the joy of, of giving something. And so I think that's a component that is really important. And as far as people, uh, you know, a woman sitting at that table and, and eating the food and say, oh, this is so good. I'm going to have to go back on my diet or no, I can't take that. I haven't heard that. I don't hear that. What I what I know is that they eat a little of everything and maybe even take twice. I also know that probably the next day they are drinking broth. Mm-hmm. But they don't say that. It's not they wouldn't want to spoil the pleasure of that meal in that particular time to, you know, bring that up. And I think that is just so incredibly classy. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, you know, that's I think that's there's so many pieces of that. Like there's the piece of not wanting to ruin the meal. I think that there's in America, there can often be this like performative guilt that people yes. have when they're like, I'm going to eat this chocolate cake. Oh, I'm so bad. And oh, I can't I imagine a French woman saying that. No, 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 no. Because you you are assigning to that piece of food a quality, you know, this is bad. Right. This is good. Of course, in America, we do that a lot for everything, especially these days. This is yeah. bad. Boom. Okay. So, whoa. And I love that about the French. They may be Me a too. in the neck about a lot of things, <laughs> but they are really, they've really got it when it comes to that. You know, just yeah, things are all bad and they're not all good. And we don't have to judge everything that we, we see and that we do. I think that's part of the joie de vivre too. Absolutely. That little, that sort of nuance and that appreciation of, you know, a moment. I think what you said about the broth too always strikes me as funny because I remember once I was sitting in a doctor's office in France reading like a, a mag, a glossy magazine written for French women. And inside it was like le menu d'après fête or le menu d'après. And so it's like, oh, the day after you've had a big dinner party, instead of having your tartine, have a low fat yogurt and a banana for breakfast. Yeah, You'll be good. That's it's right. just about, it's not about starving yourself. It's not about going on a cabbage soup cleanse. No, it's just no, about no. balance. Exactly. See, in the States, we, we do a yo-yo. We, we go all the way one way and then we go all the way the other way. Whereas the French are much more into moderation and balance. Mm-hmm. So you're right. You're absolutely right. The next day, she's not going to starve. She's going to have something different that is going to be a little bit lighter. And then she's, you know. Yes. It, it just makes more sense. But uh, but it's true that our national character as Americans, I think, is to to do everything in a very kind of exaggerated manner and, you know, kind of to just plunge in all the way one way and then ah, try to get out of it afterwards. Well, absolutely. And I think that sort of leads me into another question that I had for you, which is that so much of American lifestyle feels like it's in excess, whereas so much of French lifestyle feels like it's in moderation. And I loved how you highlighted so many of the small ways that the French sort of prioritize joy, like the prevalence of parks and gardens in their cities, or the way that small pleasures and luxuries are actually relatively affordable. Like if you want a really good piece of chocolate or a really good pastry in Paris, you can get yourself something lovely for under five euros, you can get a bouquet of flowers for your home for 10 or 15 euros. Mm -hmm. Do you think this French access to art by way of the museums or aesthetics or small pleasures is, 
is greater than the American access to those sorts of things? Well, you know, I think it depends a bit on where you live. Of course, if you're in Paris or New York City or any of the big cities in either country, uh, you're going to have a greater access to them just uh, geographically and physically speaking. But the, I think the difference is that you, you could have the, these, the joie de vivre anywhere you live if you, if you uh, are attuned to that. So even if you live in, in the country or in a small town in, in France, you can have your nice cup of coffee outside on a terrace and take the time. It's, a lot of it's about taking the time, too. You know, take the time to saunter down the street. Take the time to look in that flower shop. Take the time. It's not always about a purpose. Oh, I'm going out to buy some flowers. That's going to give me some joie de vivre kind of thing. No, the joie de vivre is total serendipity. It's a state of mind, I would say. And it's hard to have that state of mind when you live in a society uh, like America, where you you are forced to uh, be putting out all the time, and you do have worries on your head. So I think it's um, I think those luxuries are there in both societies, but it's easy, they're easier to find in France, and people are more attuned to um, living with these small luxuries and and uh, treating themselves to you know like as you say the the wonderful pastry for uh, five euros or something, right. No, you brushed up against something super interesting that I hadn't really thought about in this context, but I think it's a big piece of the puzzle as well, which is this idea of expectation, you know, that an American, I remember once when I first moved here, feeling very frustrated because I would set myself like a to-do list of tasks and I would go to the post office to buy stamps and I'd be in the line for an hour and then everyone was talking and then finally they'd be like, okay, it's noon, we're closing. And I'm like, I still haven't bought my stamps. <laughs> and I realized that I was setting myself up for failure in having these expectations where I could just have an, a two attempt list instead of a to-do list. And suddenly oh, yeah. I was a lot happier. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so right. I wonder if, yeah, that, that, that idea, that expectation, not just of accomplishment in America, but also of like, I'm going to be happy, God damn it today. Like I'm going I'm going to this fancy restaurant and I'm going to enjoy it. And then if you end up not enjoying it, suddenly you've set yourself up for failure instead of success. Yes. Also. And then there's also this thing about being tied to money. You know, I'm going to go to this fabulous restaurant and I'm going to buy this really, really expensive bottle of wine because I looked it up in Wine Spectator and this is the one that I'm supposed to be drinking and stuff. That's nice. You can afford it. And if you get great pleasure out of it, uh, that's great. But, you know... You could also go to a restaurant and just ask, you know, what's your good Cote de Rome today or something and figure it out yourself and have a nice glass of wine. And it's it's more attuned to joie de vivre, I'd say, because there's there's a factor of show off what what I can buy. You can't buy happiness anyway, but what I can buy and then that's going to make me happy. But generally that doesn't always it's not the equation that always works out. I, I It is expectations. If you don't expect to be happy, you're not going to be disappointed. That's true. And that's sort of where that pessimistic out or that perceived pessimism of the French, that like critical eye, I think maybe if they're not expecting perfection all the time, there's more space in that liminal space for them to find small joys, small pleasures, because they weren't expecting it to be perfect. Yes, which which we do. And and yet the French do do perfect. I mean, look at Yves Saint Laurent, look at the great, great couturier, the, the people who are just so into perfection, so many things that are, are perfect, but they do it with grace, I would say. It's, mm -hmm. it's a part of them. It's an inter, integral part of them. It's not something that's kind of been uh, grafted on because of a desire. Well, Absolutely. And also, like, I think when you look at those great couturier, obviously, you know, and, and even the, the even the pastry, to bring it back to the pastries, the pastries are all kind of lined up in perfection. But when you look even at the French, and you, you detailed this a lot in your book, the French approach to beauty, you know, you, you talked, um, I believe, about, you know, how French women have no qualms about throwing their dirty hair up and throwing on a scarf and a little bit of lipstick. And it's not a full face of makeup and it's not a full blowout, but they still feel beautiful in that moment. Yes. Without the perfection. Yes. It, it comes from the inside and, 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 the, and this self-confidence too, that French women, mm -hmm. they can get away with it, <laughs> you know, in, in the same way that they don't really wear outfits, you know, they do a mix and match and they put on their favorite, maybe their Chanel uh, jacket with a pair of jeans or something kind of, you know, they, uh, they have that kind of self-confidence. They can do those things. Yeah. 
Well, it definitely makes feeling pulled together feel a little more achievable here that, I mean, I feel like it's that all or nothing mentality. Like in the States, if you weren't going to put on your outfit and your full face of makeup and do your hair just so, then you see people going out in their pajamas. It's like, well, if I can't do perfect, then I might as well not try at all. Oh, exactly. That is exactly it. Now that I don't think, and I, God, I hope not. You will never see in France. Somebody told me that because I hadn't been back to the States for quite some while. And she said, yeah, these people are what, running around in pajamas. And, and I said, what? Yeah, pajamas, like kids on campus, you know, they just get out of bed and they just wear their pajamas. And I said, you must be joking. So yeah, there's a huge, huge gap there. Absolutely. Not to say that the French are always on the best dressed list and kids kids are running around and looking, you know, pretty shabby and people go to the opera now and don't dress up and, you know, but, but, but it's not pajamas. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not, it's, yeah, it's not pajamas and it is. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I think it reminds me a little bit of this example that you gave in the book of the way that the journal, the French journalists covering the Dominique Strauss-Kahn case in the U S even when they were super stressed out, even when things were really tough, they would find a way to enjoy their life, to enjoy living. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, well, that that goes back to the anecdote of the, the son of the friends of mine who's in the States and who was kind of surprised that it's all kind of all work and no play thing. Uh, uh, the French seem to always find a moment in their day to do something for themselves or with someone else or uh, to to just enjoy some thing no matter what that thing is and it doesn't have to be a big deal but but it has to be something that gets them away from just work or just the the job that they're doing mm -hmm. uh it's very different when, once i asked my sister i said do you ever go out to lunch just for the hell of it with somebody you know like a friend with no not a not a club not a not a work appointment not a something for one of the charities and that kind of stuff and she Kind of, you know, she thinks and she's just, well, actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, of course, she's my big sister and she's very serious work oriented. And I'm the little sister and, and I'm perfect for France and Joie de Vivre <laughs> because I just love serendipity. And I, I love this idea that you can just make your day what you want it to be. Yeah, I love that too. If you're enjoying this episode of Navigating the French, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, The Heart of You, where expert Annette talks manifesting, tarot, and so much more. Navigating the French will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Navigating the French. Now, he, we've been talking a lot about joy, and we've been talking a lot about happiness, but I am curious to know if you see those two words to be perfect synonyms or can you have joy without happiness can you be have joy and still be unhappy sort of where do those two meet in your That's, mind that was an interesting question that is an interesting question um i hadn't really ever thought about it well, i i'd say that uh since joy de vivre is joie de vivre is composed of uh both exuberance and exuberant pleasures and quiet pleasures you could be unhappy with certain things, but you could still find joie de vivre. You know, you might be feeling sad about losing a friend or, you know, any kind of thing. And, and, but you, you could still find the joy in maybe, I don't know, look, at that moment, looking at a bouquet of flowers or appreciating something around you. Or, you know, I, I think you, you can find joie de vivre, even if you are uh, not totally happy. Happy is a, it's a word that's a difficult word. It is a difficult one. Yeah. Happy means big smiley face. Happy means, you know, everything it means. But uh, joie de vivre, I think, is a little bit different. I would agree with you. Yeah, for sure. So it's, it's, it, that question is very, very interesting. Maybe I should write another book. <laughs> Maybe you should. <laughs> no, I, I don't know if, if I answered that question very well, but. Well, I don't think there is a real answer. I think it was more of amusing because, you know, I think as an American, you know, when I have my French friends and they're like, oh yeah, you Americans, you always think everything is so amazing and it's awesome and it's great. And 
But, you know, it almost feels they they take that to be a little bit disingenuous, where I think that finding joy, despite being, like you said, not happy with everything. I mean, I'm thinking even during the times of lockdown, for example, I, I was in Paris. Where Where were you during lockdown? I was in Paris, too. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I think, you know, it was hard. Everybody was stuck inside. I, I don't have kids, but I know people who had kids, you know, they were trying to do their job and take care of their kids. But we had these beautiful blue sky days for the first six weeks of lockdown and people were ordering wine delivered from their favorite wine cellars and they were finding ways to still find joy in a really difficult time. That's right. And the the lines, I I laughed at myself, the lines in front of the the wine shops were were just, you know, going all the way down the street. Yeah. (laughs) Because people were, you know, they said, well, I'm stuck at home, but at least I'm going to have a nice aperitif and, you know, do something, maybe cook a special dish or make the best of it. Exactly. Exactly. And I think the French make the best of it. And uh, actually, uh, this all has a lot to do with history. Uh, even, even you know, the way the, the French look glum in public and all this kind of stuff. I, I always tell students when they come here and we're talking about joie de vivre and the French and all this kind of stuff. I always tell them, remember that France is a country with a long history and there have been a lot of feasts, but there's also been famine and there's also been people invading this country. The Germans alone invaded three times, not to mention all the ones that came before. And when your country has been occupied and good heavens, here we have thinking about Ukraine, but when your when your country has been occupied, you don't look at life the same way anymore. You don't look at other people the same way. You don't know who your enemy is. And so uh, because of this history, the French are more wary and they don't wear that big happy face, even though they may have a lot of joie de vivre. That's a really important point. Yeah. Yeah. It's that public private thing again. So in their private lives, they make their joie de vivre, but for the public lives, they're very wary of their politicians and what might be come down the pike in terms of war or anything else. And we don't have that in the States. We haven't been occupied, which is a big difference. We had 9-11, but we didn't have troops, foreign troops on our soil for years and years at various times. That makes a big difference in your world outlook. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that's that ca- carrying that intergenerational memory of scarcity and occupation and secrecy. And exactly. I had never really thought about how that, how that sort of manifests in the French mindset and, and outlook today, but you're absolutely right. And in my last book, Final Transgression, is uh, based on a real story in my husband's family about uh, the tragic destiny of uh, this woman who gets caught up in all these things during World War II. If you've seen The Village Francais, my book is a little bit like The Village Francais. So, and and that that worked out generations later. I saw it with my mother-in-law and I saw with everyone who'd been through the war how it marked them. And so I don't, I don't think we Americans can come to France and just look at the French on the Metro like I did and say, oh, good Lord, they're so glum. I think there's a lot more under that skin deep, those observations. You've got to live here a long time and get into the history and, you know, do a lot of things. Well, you've probably done it too. You've been here for 15 years. So yeah, well, I, I hope to someday have been here as long as you have, but um, I, I so appreciate your insights and, and appreciate you coming on the podcast today. It's been such a such a joy talking to you. It's been a pleasure for me too. Thank you. And I just have one last question for you before I let you go, and that is, what is your favorite word in French? Oh, my favorite word in French, plaisir. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I try every day to have un plaisir. I love that. Well, it has been a plaisir speaking with you today. Thank you so much. I will drop some links into our show notes so that you can get out and read Harriet's wonderful books. And Harriet, thank you again. I hope to have you back on the podcast very soon. Thank you, Emily. I just really enjoyed it. And uh, I'll put your link on Facebook if I can to share with my followers. Wonderful. We look forward to it. Hey, great. All right. Well, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Bye-bye. This has been Navigating the French. You can find more from me, Emily Monaco, at Emily underscore in underscore France on Twitter and Instagram. This podcast is produced by Paris Underground Radio. To listen to other episodes of this podcast or to discover more podcasts like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and à bientôt.
This episode of Navigating the French was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more great content, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Paris Underground Radio.